Good morning. Welcome to worship here today on uh, this uh, second Sunday together in online-only church. We're so glad that you're joining us here. Uh, whatever it is, wherever you are, uh, we're so glad to be here with you worshiping, especially as we get to look into this wonderful story today of Jesus bringing Lazarus back to life. This, this story that is so perfect timing for us here in Lent as we journey towards the cross, as we journey towards Christ's death and resurrection, we get to see this story that is just full of foreshadowing of Christ's own death and resurrection. We get to see that in the life and death and resurrection of Lazarus, his good friend. So blessings on your service today. Uh, as far as announcements goes, really just uh, kind of one announcement with the governor's added stay-at-home order this past week. We, we decided that it was best if we had just all the, the, the musical groups who are planning on coming in today just stay home uh, and not to come in to record new music for us. Uh, we'll just use some previously recorded service music. And I think it's, you know, I think it's nice. I heard some good feedback from you guys uh, about that this past week, uh, that it, it really adds a sense of community and adds a sense of corporate worship uh, to what we're doing here online. You know, I've watched a lot of other uh, worship services put together by churches, and either they, they don't have music, which just doesn't feel right for a Sunday service, or uh, they have you know music recorded uh, alone by a couple uh, band members in their homes, that sort of thing, uh, that doesn't feel quite right either. You need the congregation together singing. And I think uh, by, luckily we had all those uh, previously recorded services that we're able to go back and take clips from and put those into worship service this morning. It really kind of restores that sense of communal worship and, and coming together and singing praises to our God. So I hope you enjoy this morning's service uh, as we uh, give our musicians a, a bit of a, a break this week. And, uh, well, we, we're just looking forward to that time when we're able to gather here back together again and lift up our voices and praise to the Lord and uh, just uh, give thanks for being restored back to this congregation, uh, back to worshiping here together. But until that happens, uh, we're glad that you're here joining us online, and uh, I urge you to, to stay safe and keep the faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us begin by raising our voices uh, to the hymn 686, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. Please stand.
Let us now confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. The scripture focus for this morning is taken from John chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that, Lazarus was sick. He stayed where he was two more days, and then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, A short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see this for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. 
When the Jews who had been out with Mary in the house, covering her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank, th I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. We sing together, Precious Lord, take my hand. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So let me begin today by saying I am starting to feel a little bit under the weather, uh, and, you know, don't, no, don't worry, it's not that. Uh, I went to the doctor, and uh, they, they told me that I have a, a sinus infection, so of all the times to be coming down with a, a regular old sinus infection, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm on antibiotics, I'm feeling, starting to feel a little bit better, uh, but we'll see. My voice is starting to go a little bit, so uh, we'll see what happens today. Uh, so, so perhaps maybe today's sermon will be a, a little bit shorter than last week's. Hey, I heard that. Anyways, we get such a wonderful story today. It's the story of Jesus raising Lazarus back to life. 
Uh, one of the most interesting uh, stories in the New Testament, I think, in, in many ways. You know, there's, there's parts that surprise us, there's parts that don't, there's parts that, that uh, lead right up into Christ's crucifixion. I mean, look at where we're going. He, we're here on our Lenten journey, journeying towards the cross, right? Journeying towards Christ's death, journeying towards Easter Sunday, where Christ himself it, rises back to life. And here we have this little foreshadowing story of Christ's friend, his close, his dear friend Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, who dies. Not only that, but Jesus kind of he lets him die. Which is surprising for us, surprising thing for, for Jesus to do. But uh, Jesus has a reason for all that. We're going to take a look at that here today in our text. Let me read for you. This is uh, John chapter 11, starting with verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Let's, let's just stop there for a moment. Uh, what? Right? That, that didn't make sense. Jesus, he hears that his dear friend is sick. Very, very sick. And what does he do? Does he drop everything to run and be with him? You know, Jesus, knowing that he can heal, does he go directly to Lazarus to heal him? No. He, he bides his time. He tarries where he is, right? Uh, it says he stays two days longer in the place where he was. Jesus intentionally waited for Lazarus to die. If I was Lazarus uh, and, and Jesus finally showed up and rose me, rose me back to life, I might, I might have a question for him <laughs> or two. Like, hey, what were you doing for those two days? Uh, you know, I uh, suffered through that illness. You couldn't come and you know, help me out a couple days ago? But no, Jesus, he has a reason for what he does. Okay, so we continue on. We'll skip ahead a few verses uh, up to verse 11. And so Jesus has had a little discussion with his disciples. And uh, then after these two days have passed... He says to them, after saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, and I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. And the disciples, they hear that Lazarus has fallen asleep, and what they say is, great, you know, that's good. He, you know, he's sick, he needs his rest, right? It's like Jesus said, and Lazarus, he has fallen asleep, and has stayed well hydrated and, you know, ate, ate a little bit, you know, got, got some food down. Uh, you know, the disciples think this is great. This is good news. That means he's going to get better. And the disciples, they just don't get it, right? The, the, the meaning of Jesus' words, it kind of goes right to understanding. Which reminds me of a joke. You know, well, there, once was a, there was a dad who was trying to convey to his young son the dangers of alcohol. And he sat him down, he, he got out two glasses, he poured one glass full of water, he pull, poured the other glass full of whiskey. And he took two little worms, and he put one worm in the glass of water, and he put the other worm in the glass of whiskey. And they sat there, and they watched as the, the worm in the water, it squirreled, spilled around a bit, you know, but it was, it was just fine. Uh, but the, the worm in the whiskey immediately curled up and, and died. And the father said to the son, well, son, what does that teach you? And the boy thinks about it. He says, well, if I drink whiskey, I won't get worms. And they just don't get it. So Jesus, he's got to make it clear for them, right? We, we come back to the text, um, and we jump ahead to verse 14. And Jesus, you can kind of imagine him shaking his head at the disciples. And he says, then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. What a, what a bold statement from Jesus. Right? I am glad that Lazarus has died, so that you may believe. Clearly, Jesus has something very important and miraculous in store for them. So Jesus, he travels to Bethany, and he, he gets there, 
And, you know, Bethany is pretty close to Jerusalem. It's about two miles off of Jerusalem. And he finds that they are uh, right in the middle of all the, uh, the, the burial ceremony uh, for Lazarus because Lazarus has been dead for four days now. And while Jesus is approaching, uh, Mary and Martha hear that he's coming. And Martha, she gets up and she runs out to meet Jesus. And Mary stays there in the house, probably presumably to, to meet with the people who are coming and, and visiting, offering their condolences, sort of like a, a visitation. Uh, but, you know, Lazarus isn't there. He's already been placed in the tomb. Uh, but she's there receiving people. You know, they come to the house, they expect to find the family. So Martha, she runs out to meet Jesus, which is, you know, this is kind of, it, it, it goes with her character, right? Mar Martha is the more active one. She's the one who's keeping busy, always doing things, got to keep going, 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 where Mary uh, is sort of the, the calmer, ready to, to sit and listen. We have that story where, where Mary and Martha, uh, Mary sits at Jesus' feet and listens to him while Martha is busy uh, getting ready for the dinner. Uh, and here we see the same sort of thing where where Mary, again, she she's sitting there uh, with Lazarus as part of these burial ceremonies. And uh, Martha, got to keep going, goes and meets Jesus before he even arrives. And, you know, Martha sometimes gets the bad rap in that other account because, you know, Mary's the one sitting and listening to Jesus, and Jesus compliments her, and she did the right thing. Uh, but here we see this tremendous uh, confession of faith come from Martha, right? She says to Jesus, she says uh, in verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. I mean, a, a, an incredible statement of faith coming from her, really at a time where, you know, oftentimes when we go through the loss of a loved one, it shakes us and sometimes even shakes our faith. Not so with Martha. Not at all. It, it seems to, to reinvigorate and, and make her double down on what she believes. Uh, she comes right out the, off the bat with, uh, Jesus, had you been here, he wouldn't have died. She believes that he could have healed Lazarus. Right? And, and then she goes on to say, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, he'll give you. Talk about kind of a lead-in, right? Kind of, kind of asking Jesus for something even more, even now, even after, four days after Lazarus has died. And Jesus, he says to her, you know, your brother will rise again. And she says, yes, I know, I know he'll rise again on the resurrection on the last day, which is another great statement of faith, right? A amazing statement of faith for this first century woman. And Jesus, he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asks her that question, right? That question that uh, it, it kind of keeps coming back to. Do you believe this? Right? Do you believe? Do you believe all this, all this that you're saying, that, that who, who Jesus is, his identity and his relationship with God, do you believe and she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. That's amazing. You are the Christ, which is the Greek way of saying you are the Messiah. You are the Hebrew Messiah, the one that the Jewish people have been waiting for, the long-promised Messiah who would come and restore the people of Israel. It's, it's one of the most heartfelt, moving confessions of faith that I think we see in the New Testament. So Jesus, he calls together Mary and Martha both, and he meets them in the house, and he says to them, uh, continuing on in verse 32, 
Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Right? We, we heard that. Uh, sounds like Mary and Martha had been talking about this before Jesus arrived. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Which is, by the way, the shortest verse in the Bible. Did you know that? Uh, John chapter 11, verse 35. Jesus wept. Sometimes I wonder why, when the numberings were put in, they chose to make that a verse by itself, right? Uh, it could have just been tacked on with one of the, the other ones. But it's perfect, I think, because it has such deep emotional meaning. To see Jesus weeping over the loss of a friend. Uh, you know, not only that, but over the loss of a friend that he knows he's going to go bring him back to life right now. You know, it's not like he's never going to see him again, right? Or even, even not like he, he, does, he has to wait until he gets to heaven to see him again. Uh, Jesus knows that, you know, get, give him an hour, and Lazarus is going to be up walking around again. And yet, he still weeps. He weeps because Lazarus had to suffer death. And that word, that word in the Greek there, that word for greatly troubled, it, uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful word. It, it, uh, it means anger, right? He's anger, he's troubled. But the root of that word, it comes from this, uh, it's, it's a snarling of an animal. It is guttural and animalistic. Right? You can just imagine Jesus' pain, his anguish over this death. It comes out uh, almost like a growl. So in verse 38, Jesus, he comes to the tomb, a cave with a stone laying up against it. Does it sound familiar? Are we, we, we're talking about, you know, these are the burial caves in that area. This is the exact same sort of thing that, that Jesus is going to be laid in, it, it seems. Um, so they come to the, the cave, the stone lays up against it, and he says, Jesus says, take away the stone. And Martha, uh, the sister of the dead man, it says, uh, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Uh, she's probably a little nervous. You know, not that she doesn't have faith, not that she doesn't know that Jesus could raise Lazarus back to life, but, but Lazarus has been decomposing for four days. You know, this is a time back before formaldehyde and you know, all the, the, the modern-day practices of embalming. Uh, bodies, you know, they, they started to decompose pretty quickly, so you had to do the, the service and get the person buried very quickly. So four days after um, Lazarus has died, he's not going to be in the greatest of conditions. Jesus, he, he has no concern for this, right? He says, he says to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And they certainly are about to see the glory of God, right? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always heard me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And this always seems like an odd verse to me a little bit, right? This is Jesus, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of showboating a little bit, right? He's standing up and he's making this big bold proclamation to the Father, a verbal prayer. Dear Father, I give thanks that you have always heard me. And it's not a genuine prayer so much as it is Jesus is saying this so that everybody around, remember all those Jews who came uh, with, with the, who came together to, to mourn Lazarus' passing? So all these people who were there to watch all this going on, Jesus says this, this verbal loud prayer, so that everybody would know that when, when Jesus raises Lazarus back to life in a moment, that, that Jesus is doing this in God the Father's name. Then we get to verse 43. 
This is, this is the key verse in this whole text, right? When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Such a simple command. Right? Such a simple command to reverse the effects of death and decay. Jesus' words, they are powerful. These are the words of the God who created the universe. Not, not just created it, but spoke it into existence. Let there be light. Right? There's light. It's God's word that is so powerful that it creates everything and it brings Lazarus back to life. And you know why that's so amazing for us? Why it hits home so directly for us? Because we have God's word. That same word that is so powerful in and of itself, it is given to us to teach us. To show us that everything, everything God wants us to know about him, it is right here in his word. And this word here, the written text, it has the same power that the verbal word does. It has the power to change lives. To take sinners and make them saints. God's word has power. So read it. In verse 44, we see the miracle happen. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Lazarus, he doesn't, he doesn't even stop to take the bandages off. He has to stop to, to unwrap the cloth. He immediately follows Jesus' command. Lazarus, come out. Because Jesus' word is power. So the, the people there, the Pharisees gathered, the Jews, they, they see what has happened, that Lazarus has come back to life, and they, they still don't understand they just still don't get it. They walk away from this with the, the entirely wrong message. You know, the Pharisees, they double down again on their desire to kill Jesus. Oh, naturally, this, this man, he could bring the dead back to life, so we got to kill him. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Reminds me of a joke, though. Uh, there once was a uh, cowboy who was out, out in the fields, and uh, he was reading his favorite Bible. Bible he'd had for, for years and years since he was a little boy. And he, somewhere along the course of the day, he lost it. It, it fell off the saddle, uh, you know, and he got back home. He discovered his Bible was missing. He was heartbroken. He went back out into the fields, looked, looked all around, tried to retrace his steps, couldn't find this childhood Bible, and he was just devastated by it. A couple weeks went by, and one day he sees this cow coming up to him. It's, you know, directly walking straight towards him. And as the cow gets closer, he notices there's something in its mouth. And the cow gets right up to him, and he sees that in, in the cow's mouth is his Bible. It's his childhood Bible right there. So he runs over, he, he takes, it, takes it out of the cow's mouth, and he pats the cow on the head. He says, this is incredible. It's amazing. You found my Bible, and you knew to bring it back to me? That, 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 unbelievable. And the cow says, well, it's not that unbelievable. Your name's written on the inside cover. Talk about taking the wrong, wrong thing away, right? Focusing on, on the wrong, wrong aspect. I don't know. It, it just amazes me at how much we see the Pharisees observe Jesus, interact with Jesus, watch everything that he's doing, watch all these signs that he's performing that clearly... He's, he's not just another rabbi. He's not just a prophet either, that, that he is the Son of God, that he is the promised Messiah. There's so many signs, and the more proof and evidence the Pharisees get, the more they want to kill Jesus. 
It makes no sense. It makes no sense unless, unless it's happening for a reason. Unless there's a reason why Jesus allows this all to happen, a reason why God intends for this to happen, right? which we know that's, that's the case. Jesus is willingly going towards the cross. God sent him for the sole purpose of going to that cross. Jesus trusts in the plan of the Father. Jesus knows what he has to do. And he's willing to do it. He's willing to do it out of love for you, for me, for, for, for everybody. Jesus is willing to sacrifice his own life so that we can have eternal life. That's how much your Lord loves you. That's how much God is always willing to, to chase after you, to come to find you, to be with you. He, he goes out of his way to show you his love. He, he dies for us because he loves us. And if nothing else, appreciate how big that is. Because, because there are times in our lives when we forget just how much God loves us. Maybe that time is now for you. Maybe, you know, being cooped up in your house with this stay-at-home order. Maybe, maybe it feels like the world has abandoned you, like God has abandoned you. Don't forget how much God has proven he's loved us. How much God has proven he loves you. Right? In the midst of this, God is there loving us, continuing to love us and to provide for us and to care for us. Even, even if we get sick, even if we were to die, God has a plan for that. And he has demonstrated that plan here in today's scripture lesson. This message of Lazarus, it's not just a cute little story about a friend of Jesus who dies and then comes back to life. This story of Lazarus, it's about you. It's about what you have to look forward to. You have the future where Jesus says to you, Lazarus, or insert your name here, come out. Come out of the grave. Come out of death. Come into eternal life. And there is one way that we can answer that call of our Lord. We need to answer that question that he asks to Martha. Do you believe? Because if we do, if you do, then you have that same future and promise of eternal life that he gives to all who believe in him and call upon his name. God promises to save all who will call upon Christ's name. Is that you? Oh, let it be you today. Thanks be to God that he has provided for us throughout our entire lives, but more importantly, he has provided for our eternity. Amen. Now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us confess together our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. We come, O Lord, with the dry bones of our broken hopes and disappointed dreams. Bind us up in Christ that we may learn to pray with confidence, trusting in your mercy to supply us with all things needful to us and to our salvation. Almighty God, everlasting Father, you saw Israel in their despair and raised them up to hope by placing your spirit upon them. Join us together with the communion of saints in Christ, even though we must for a time stand apart. Raise up, uh, us up from our weariness and grant us your spirit that we may be strong in faith, bold in witness, holy in life, and steadfast in hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God of power and might, you hold in your hand all the might of man. Give to us good governance and faithful leaders who will heed your word and pursue righteousness and justice. Bless and defend us against all destruction, especially from this deadly pandemic, and teach us to be patient and faithful citizens of this land using ourselves and our resources wisely for the good of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O most merciful Lord, your Son shed tears for Lazarus, whom he loved. Grant your compassion, patience, and endurance to all who suffer illness, who are troubled in mind, or whose, whose time on earth is short. Spare us from death now, but give us courage and comfort far stronger by your power over death. Eternal God, you carry the grief of all those who mourn and remember all who die in Christ. Give comfort to the grieving and peace to the dying, and give that same comfort and peace to us who live in the shadow of fear and death, that we would neither live nor grieve as people without hope, but trust in you at every hour. Hear all our prayers, especially on behalf of your people, as we pray today for Kristen, Christina, Eleanor, Jan, Dick, Jane, Doug, Rose, Bill, Kenneth, Kylie, Anita, Elsa, Ken, Edith, Joan, Bud, Ed, Nicole, Randy, Nancy, Jim, Gary, and Craig. And for all those who, do, who we now name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O gracious God, you daily and richly grant us all things we need for this body and life. Bless our labors and grant us wisdom to use the fruits of those labors wisely and well for the care of our families, for the poor and their needs, and for the support of your work in this congregation. Preserve us from fear and greed as we live and work alone, and turn us instead in love toward our neighbors, toward whoever, however distant. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, Almighty God, through your Son, you have kept the promise of the ages and rescued us from sin. You have raised up the dry bones of a people captive to death and made us alive in Christ forever. Sustain us in this hope that we may endure the tests, trials, and troubles of this life and be ready when our Savior comes again in his glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated as we sing together hymn number 543, What Wondrous Love Is This? <laughs>
Thanks for worshiping with us here this morning. Until we're able to gather here together and you can be with me here again in the narthex and we can share coffee and bagels and donuts and cookies and all the good stuff that I know you're missing in addition to the fellowship that we have here in this congregation. Until we're all back here together, stay safe and keep the faith.